So a few days ago, Venerable Jampa sent a, um, an email letting us know that Venerable Kusuma, who was the first nun in Sri Lanka who had received the Bhikkhuni ordination in uh, 10 centuries, had passed away. She died on August 30th. She was 92 years old. She died of COVID, actually. Um, she had been hospitalized and done well. And then the story is that when she got, came home after a few days, her blood oxygen levels dropped and there was nothing that could be done. But they said she died peacefully. Um, and there are many, 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 um, on all these Buddhist sites, there are many congratulations and may she, may she attain Nibbana, may she attain Nibbana, may she attain Nibbana as good wishes for her passing. But um, even though she's, um, she's somebody that I think it's important for us to know and to acknowledge her contribution to um, the continuation of the nun's order in the world, she was um, a scholar. She was a, micro, a molecular biologist that she taught in the United States and then University English and Science when she went back to Sri Lanka. Um, but she said in an interview, she said, um, as much as a scientist, Buddhism gives priority to the mind. There is no scientific evidence there. There is no physical evidence there. You cannot experiment on mental phenomena like feelings, recognitions, perceptions, volitions, and memory, things like that. So what's unusual about her is that, again, that she was the first in um, bringing the bhikkhuni ordination back to Sri Lanka after it had been lost for 10 centuries, we don't know. Um, she was ordained in 1996 in India, um, an or ordination that was organized by the Mahabodhi Society. It was done in the Dharma Guptaka tradition. Um, the Chinese tradition. It was, of course, then quite controversial because she was a Theravadan bhikkhuni from Sri Lanka. Um, and the, um, it was so controversial and in a way so dangerous that she and the other nine nuns that were ordained with her stayed in India for two years and did not go back to Sri Lanka because they would not be allowed to um, practice or be recognized. It was not safe for them. I don't know the story of how it became safe, and well, children may, may know that, but, but today in Sri Lanka, so that was 1996, today in Sri Lanka there are 5,000 bhikkhunis, fully ordained nuns, and the order is growing. So this is a, um, a mother of the tradition. When she spoke to the Congress um, on the bhikkhuni ordination with it, His Holiness was a part of in 2007, she said very clearly she said, it is recorded that the bhikshuni ordination went to Sri Lanka when King Ashoka sent his daughter to uh, establish it there. And it flourished in Sri Lanka. And it was the bhikshuni ordination in Sri Lanka that went to China that established the bhikshuni ordination that um, for us, fortunately, flourished in China for all these subsequent centuries. So, her uh, view, therefore, is we're just bringing it back home to Sri Lanka, where you got it from in the first place. That there is, as Venerable Trajan also teaches us, there's no Mahayana Vinaya, there's no Theravada Vinaya, it is the Vinaya that the Buddha gave. And so through her leadership and through her practice, um, the Bhikshuni ordination is flourishing in Sri Lanka. Uh, but the thing I found most interesting was that what was what made her ordain? She read the Terigata. She said she was a scientist and that she was um, asking these important, important questions. And that's what I'm looking for. Well, I'll have to tell you the story from memory. She became a scientist because she wanted to know why are we born? Why are we suffering? Why are we dying? And she could not, could not, could not, could not find answers in molecular biology or anywhere else in science. And so she um, met the Dharma and then returned to Sri Lanka and got, uh, decided to study um, the Dharma instead. So she got a PhD in some, some poly something of her of the, the tradition. While she was studying for her PhD, she got hold of the Terigata and the verses of the early nuns talking about their enlightenment experience. And she said as she read it, she wept. Where are these bhikshunis, she said. 
Who are these Terrys? Where are they? And so she began to look and find out, how can this happen? Here are these women who, and then she describes the history. During India at that time, the role of women, I mean, we, th we think we understand what that is, but as she described it, really, marrying girls off as small children to be raised in their husband's household as their servants from the time they're married there. They are nothing but servants and childbearers throughout all of India, right? And yet, the Buddha recognized that women had the capacity to attain nirvana, 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 nirvana equally with men. And in establishing the bhikshuni order, he took women who were the lowest of the low of all societies. No matter what caste, the women were lower in the caste, no matter where you were, and made them equal to the monks. Made them equal in the sense that she says, on, the, on one side, the monks sat but when the Buddha taught, monks sat here, and the men sat behind the lay men sat behind him, the nuns sat here, and the lay women sat behind them. She said that was equality. That that's what's, that was her description. <laughs> that that is the equality that was established during the Buddha's time. And so there were women who were nothing but uh, who were completely uneducated who had you know, no opportunity to develop their minds, are now arhats explaining you know, their experience. So this is what led her to seek ordination. <laughs> and so the stories of how that came about are, are probably long and detailed. But she continues to just emphasize how reading these poems changed her life. And reading these poems changing her life changed the lives of at least 5,000 bhikkhunis in Sri Lanka today. Who knows how many more going forward. So as much as it's important to kind of eulogize and appreciate the life of Aya Kusuma, to think about, you know, when these nuns uttered these words 2,500 years ago, I don't know if they're on the camera, they weren't thinking, oh, Somebody's going to write these down, and I'm going to be published, and these poems are going to have an impact. They were sharing their experience. That experience has lived on, it has continued, it has been part of the conditions that have created the opportunities for women, and also for men, for monks too, to meet the Dharma, to be inspired, to practice for 2,500 years. I am quite sure when Aya um, Kushuma pursued bhikshuni ordination, she was not, I mean, sure she was thinking of the future, but she didn't think, I'm going to become a famous founder of the bhikshuni lineage in Sri Lanka. She was doing her spiritual practice and following what was guided in her heart to find the truth. Why are we born? Why do we suffer? Why do we die? And to, in her tradition, to reach nirvana, the highest state that liberates us from all of that. Without any thought of fame, without any of that, but simply doing her practice and the impact is so incredibly powerful. So for me, that's really the inspiration to continue to be, that to practice for whether we're bhikshunis or bhikkhus or um, lay practitioners or whatever, to practice without by tr continually trying to remove from any aspect of our practice the eight worldly concerns as a part of our motivation and simply to do what we need to do in order to cultivate the um, qualities of the early Terries, to cultivate the qualities of the Bodhisattvas that we admire, to cultivate the qualities of the Buddha, with the understanding that whatever we do does have an impact in the world, right? So it's not to become famous, it's not to found an order, it's not to be the first, it's not to have be on magazine covers, it's not any of those things. It's to do our practice, to do the Dharma for ourselves, to make it available to others as much as we can, and to let our own uh, wish to become fully awakened so that we have the skills and capabilities to become it, be the motivation always. And in that way, the impact is huge. Uncountable, who knows 25 centuries from now? We don't know. Um, but we know that 
the seeds that we plant for ourselves will still be ripening for ourselves. So thank you for her. And uh, so they said that, I don't know what the ceremony was, but she was, um, she was to be buried or her body was to be dealt with within 24 hours very quickly. So uh, we can make good prayers for her rebirth and, uh, and remember her as also part of the network of causes and conditions that bring about our opportunity to practice that shravasti at least.